All right, hello everyone. Uh, before we get started, Third Place Books would like to acknowledge that we are in the unceded ancestral land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present and honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish people. So welcome to our virtual event space. My name is Allie and I'm your host for this evening. And I am so excited to be introducing Hunter Shobi and David Baneth here to discuss their book, Upper Left Cities, a cultural atlas of San Francisco, Portland and Seattle, joined by one of their contributors, Jeff Gibson. Uh, but before we get into the good stuff, I just want to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in. As much as we miss having you all in the bookstore, it has been such a delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. So I will be linking books directly in the chat all evening, so it'll be super easy to go find them. For those of you in the Seattle area, come on in. All three of our locations are open. Open, or you can place an order online and come pick them up in store. Or if you're not local, we of course do ship. And once again, we are very, very grateful for your support. Uh, while you're over on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the next few months. And if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs, and of course, follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations. Speaking of social media, if you'd like to check out some of our past virtual events, you can find most of them on our YouTube channel, including this event within the next 48 hours. So if you'd like to see our other virtual events or share this one, go ahead and track us down over there. Uh, we are here for about an hour and towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. We would love to know where you're tuning in from or your favorite latest read. But when it comes time for questions, do make sure those end up in the Q&A where we can most easily find them. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone of our commitment to ensuring the safety and well-being of event attendees and guest authors. So in our chat and question spaces, please do lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. Uh, there are auto-generated closed captions available from the menu at the top or bottom of the screen. Select the live transcript button to enable or disable them. And finally, should any technical issues arise, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them. And we appreciate your patience and understanding understanding. Uh, so I believe that that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce our authors. First, Hunter Shobi, cultural geographer and assistant professor at Portland State University. He holds a PhD in geography from the University of Oregon and has more than 20 years of experience researching the cultural, political, and economic dimensions of how people connect to places and environments. His past studies have focused on diverse topics, including the role of football club uh, Barcelona in constructing urban identity in Barcelona and national identity in Catalonia. Uh, joining us next, we have David Baines, who has managed the Center for Spatial uh, Analysis and Research in the Geography Department at Portland State University since 2006, working with a wide variety of partners at the federal, state, and local levels. His work explores the diverse ways that cartographers can tell stories and maps, focusing on the mapping of non-traditional subjects. Together, they co-authored Portlandness and now Upper Left Cities, a cultural atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle, a new cultural atlas that compares and contrasts three cutting edge progressive cities through 150 innovative infographic maps. So thank you all so much for being here. I am so excited to listen in on this conversation. If you need anything, of course, give me a shout. I will be listening. And that goes the same for everyone in the audience. I will be in chat. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage to our authors. So welcome. Thank you, Ali, so much. And thanks uh, to Third Place Books for having us here today. We're really excited to be chatting with you about this book we've spent several years working on. A, a shout out goes to Sasquatch Books, also of Seattle, who are our publishers who have been fantastic to work with. To work with. And so we're 
we feel really lucky that we're in good hands with them. Uh, and so we're going to get this started here. And today, the, the reading will be a little bit different than most book readings you may have attended in the sense that we're not going to really read anything from the book at all. But rather, we're going to talk to you a little bit about the spirit of the project and talk to you about how some of these pages came together. Um, uh, we, we've got David Bannis here, and we've also got Jeff B Gibson. So Jeff was one of the main contributors for the book. Uh, depending on how you count, we had 40 contributors, and we had a sort of a, a smaller core as well. But we're really pleased uh, to have Jeff with us because it, it will help really communicate to you that this is a project that was very collaborative. And a lot of people came together and compared ideas and iterated ideas. Um, and what, you, you know, what you'll see in the book is something that's not just the work of a few people, but a, a work of a team of people. And so we're really pleased to help communicate that um, with the three of us talking to you today. But before we talk too much about the details of what's in the book, I wanna talk more generally about this concept of a cultural atlas, because most people know what an atlas is, and it's a, you know, it's a reference book or is it gazetteer or something that you go look up where different places are. And it's often something that you would look at and expect to find very similar maps from page to page. But our take on the atlas is a, is a bit different. It's a cultural atlas. And what we're seeking to do is to make the maps look very different. So we're using non-traditional mapping styles, non-traditional mapping topics in order to tell stories of, in this case, San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. So cultural atlas is something that will provide you with a new cartography, a new way of understanding these places hopefully, even if these are places that you know really well. One of the things as geographers we're really interested and compelled by are the way that different places have such different meanings for, for different people, or similar places. So you have one place and a lot of people are contesting it. They, they have different ideas about what it should mean. That's something that's really compelling to us. And a cultural atlas helps us get at those different meanings as well. Something a cultural atlas can do for us is challenge and develop our geographic imagination. We all have imaginations of places that we've been to, even places we haven't been to. And it's formed by our own experiences, stories that we've heard, you know, things that we've seen through media. And so we hope that this will give a new, a new rich set of ideas to draw from when you're imagining what these places are like. The other thing we wanna say about this is that there are so many stories that you could tell about any one city, particularly three cities, if you're comparing them. And so this atlas isn't intended to be comprehensive in any way. We told the stories that we thought we could told, tell well with maps. And there's things that are important in these cities that aren't necessarily there. What this is meant to be really is a point of departure for us to all consider and think about these great cities, cities that all of us who contributed to us, the three of us certainly here have a great a deal of affection and respect for. And so that was, that's the way we set up our project and trying to, to make a cultural atlas with these different looks at these different cities. So since this um, atlas, well, it's very map focused. And so with, when we give any of these talks, we'd like to have share a few thoughts about maps and about the people who make maps. Um, and that's because people have, the maps have a very strong hold on people's imaginations. Um, people just believe maps. They have a lot of authority. Um, ask yourself, when's the last time you questioned something that was on a map? Doesn't happen very often. But we like to remind people of a couple different things. One is that <clears throat> maps are simply representations of how people see places. They are not the places themselves. Um, a well-known quote says, the map is not the territory. Um, and that's well taken. Um, and all these maps then, because of that, they represent a point of view and they tell a story, um, regardless of what kind of map we're talking about. Um, and also a reminder that these maps are made by people. Those, and those people, the cartographers, always make decisions about what to include and maybe more importantly, what not to include on a map. The world is so complex, you can't put everything on a map. And oftentimes you only put a few things on the map. What do you leave in? What do you leave out? Um, and they make that choice. They want to tell a story and they make those choices. And so um, in keeping with that, here's just a 
just a note for when you see maps of these cities that there's this little diagram here down below um, that shows the relative sizes of each of the three cities. Um, San Francisco and Seattle together would fit inside of Portland. Portland is almost three times as big as San Francisco. Um, but in, in, the, in making this book, we have modified the size of geographic features so that the maps are more or less the same size. They don't necessarily represent the exact geography of these places. many different topics in this book here. And we all kind of went with our passions to a certain degree and thought about what we wanted to work on. Now I'm somebody who when he goes to a city likes to walk around cemeteries and maybe, maybe I'm revealing a little too much by saying that, but I, I have a feeling I might not be alone because you can learn a lot from looking at cemeteries. And as we started to research the three cities, we instantly found out some very interesting information. It, the story almost has to start with San Francisco because in San Francisco around 1900, they made it illegal for anybody to be buried in the city anymore. The exception there were a couple um, cemeteries in the Presidio. One is the National Cemetery, which is for soldiers, and the other is the Pet Cemetery, which is remarkably well preserved there. And so in San Francisco, you can't be buried there anymore. And not only that, from about 1900 for the next several decades, they exhumed all the bodies from the cemeteries that existed there and brought them to the city of Colma. And Colma is just south of San Francisco. We're told it's a city of a thousand people and a million um, graves. And so this is where people are, we thought this was fascinating. We've heard that in many cities throughout the world that you know where their rents are really high, that, that cemeteries are, are disappearing and that there isn't room for people to be buried and to commemorate their dead. And we, what we found out was that San Francisco was not alone. Here's a picture you can see from 1931 of workers um, emptying out the uh, Oddfellow Cemetery uh, around where Masonic Avenue is right now in San Francisco. Uh, beneath that, you can see that the old cemetery is where there is now a public park. And we were very excited to find in the archives the, the document that illustrated this change. Um, and even in Portland, we found that some of the original uh, grave sites on the downtown area bodies were exhumed and brought to Lone Fur and other things. So I mean, it tells us a little bit about the way cities change and some similarities between them. San Francisco's story stands out a little much uh, from, from the others. And then when it came time to, to make the maps, our cartographers put what they thought was a, a pretty good looking sort of uh, halo effect, sort of a ghostly situation there. And, and this accompanies an essay here talking about um, what we've entitled the graveyard shift. And so this is this one slice of looking at these three cities. Okay, so we explored a number of ideas that centered on the idea of public space. So those areas of the city that we all have access to. Um, and we settled on, in looking at the three cities, on two successful transformations of portions of um, downtown landscape in Portland and San Francisco. And then um, one failed proposal in Seattle. And that failed proposal is shown on the left here, a, a recreation of the plan for the Seattle Commons. That would be Central Park for the city that would have connected South Lake Union to downtown. Um, great idea. Fast forward 25 years from when the voters turned down this proposal and the area is um, chock full of high rise condos and office buildings in support of Amazon and such. Um, and not a park. Um, and on a more positive angle on the <laughs> right is uh, the city of Portland, which shows the um, removal of the Harbor Drive Freeway on the west or downtown side of the Willamette River. Um, when it became obsolete, when Interstate 5 was built on the east side, it afforded the city the opportunity to take out that um, Harbor Drive and replace it with a park, which is the signature public space of the city at this point in time. And it's even hard to imagine um, the city without it anymore. Um, but it took, you know, a determination to make it actually happen. Um, a, a similar sort of thing has happened, and I'm not showing it here, but 
city of San Francisco at, um, post the 1989 earthquake, the Embarcadero Freeway was removed, creating a um, something of a public space that revitalized the Embarcadero region. Um, so um, I wanted to note that these, these maps, recreations essentially were created by a former student and now professional cartographer, Gabriel Rousseau. Um, and also that, um, well, if that Seattle viaduct had come out sooner, um, we and that area had been rebuilt, then we really would have had the true analog for all three cities, but that's a story for another day. One of the things that uh, the three of us and our contributors really wanted to include in the book in some way was music, because everybody's everybody likes music and, and we wanted to tell an interesting story about music. And one of the things we, started to, to gravitate towards was looking at this um, period of time when, when there was this vibrant jazz scene in each city. Uh, in each case, they were centered on a particular street. It, weren't ex it wasn't exclusively on that street, but Fillmore Street in San Francisco, Williams Avenue in Portland and Jackson Street in Seattle were really the heart of the African-American communities in many ways. For one reason, they had to be because through redlining and other things, um, people were constrained in where they could live. Uh, but once these areas became densely populated and there were um, businesses owned by uh, African Americans, one of the things we saw was the emergence of this, these jazz clubs. And you would have nationally touring acts, regional acts, and local acts coming through. And so to, to symbolize that era of those jazz clubs, we researched these clubs and then we put them down on liner music as if they were, they were streets. So what we see for Fillmore Street on the top, for example, are different places that are located uh, on Fillmore Street. And you can see sort of the, the distance and the cross streets are some of the bars that come up. Um, and these are all areas that were broken up by a process called revitalization, um, renewal, in which the cities would say, oh, Williams Avenue is hopelessly blighted when in fact it was a vibrant, important area, uh, very, um, vital area and that was broken up in, in a national era of blockbusting. And in the case of Portland, for example, some of the, uh, some of the land that was taken was, was not even used for the intended purpose of some of the hospital that they intended to use it. So there's, there's a dark side of the story here to some of these cities and we want to commemorate what we've lost. But at the same time, we also want to recognize that the uh, tradition of, of playing live music, of playing jazz music hasn't disappeared. Um, Jazz means something now than it did 50 or 60 years ago. Um, but in each city, you can find hungry musicians who are out there um, and, and, and looking to, to make their living playing this fantastic music. So this speaks to a, a past era, but also touches on um, the present time as well. Okay, so if you've... Well, I don't know if you've wondered why gas prices vary so much across cities, but we did. Um, and we decided to explore this as a topic. Um, so to make these maps, what we did was sampled gas prices um, on one particular day in the summer of 2019 in each of the three cities. And then we... Um, estimated what the prices would be throughout the city or in map talk interpolated those values. And um, then one of our contributors, um, Kelly Neely Brown, designed a whole series of um, oil slick based color palettes. Um, and we finally chose the one that's shown here um, to symbolize the data. And so you can ask yourself then, with the patterns you see on the map, why, why are the highs where they are? Why are the lows where they are? Um, and you can start to, to imagine why that would be based on what you know about the city itself. Um, with a few exceptions, and it's kind of crazy that some of these exceptions stay in business, um, the prices track pretty well with the median income of given neighborhoods. Um, but we'll leave it to you to, um, based on what you know about the cities, to try to figure out why 
why the prices vary so much um, across the city and why is it high and low in different spots. And I'll note that um, one of these, portion of one of these maps is on the cover of the book. And so at this point, I'm going to introduce um, one of our major contributors who's with us tonight, Jeff Gibson, to talk about his work on this book. And um, Jeff is a city transportation planner who loves all things geography and cartography and graphic design. And so when he isn't working as a planner or working on a, a book like this, you can find him enjoying a cup of tea or a refreshing beer around the city of Portland, uh, of course, depending on the time of day. So with that, Jeff, take it away. Thanks, David. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me all right. Um, yeah, um, you know, just to uh, kick things off with, with sort of my maps here, um, based on sort of what Hunter was saying earlier, um, you know, or maybe it was David talking about sort of cartographic, you know, freedom and sort of the way that we are interpreting maps. Um, I took a little bit more cartographic freedom with these. Um, so just a, a sort of synopsis of what we're looking at here. This is a page spread for um, essentially where coin operated uh, video game, arcades, video games, um, you know, I think even maybe even pool tables, pinball machines, that kind of stuff um, are located within each city. Um, and as somebody who was sort of raised in the 90s, um, as a kid, I remember going to a lot of these things uh, throughout uh, the city. Um, and I kind of remember them slowly disappearing. You know, it wasn't that long ago, though I guess now it's starting to get fairly long ago, um, that arcades would be fairly common. Um, and certainly today they are much less common. Um, so what we thought would be fun is sort of taking this data of where are coin-operated machines, you know, whether they're located in a bar or an actual arcade of some sort, or, you know, I think maybe even, geez, uh, David, was there any, like, uh, maybe in, like, malls or something? I, I can't remember um, all the various locations, but just a wide array of sort of where, where these machines are popping up and then starting to map them. And so if we go to the next um, slide, we can get a little bit closer look at um, two of our cities. So, um, on the left here is, is Portland, um, and on the right here is Seattle. I'll talk a little bit about uh, Seattle uh, more, uh, given the audience. Um, and, and so I kind of wanted to, um, you know, as I was parsing out this data and thinking about video games and arcades, you know, I kept going back to, you know, wanting to visualize them in the style of some of the old classic uh, games that I used to play as a kid. Um, and obviously, um, uh, hopefully everybody recognizes it. It's uh, it's sort of in the style of, of Seattle, certainly of Pac-Man. Um, though I've made some creative differences. If anybody here used to play the Pac-Man games, um, there would have been little fruits um, that you know you'd run around and collect. Um, I opted for vegetables instead. Um, I think everybody needs to eat some more vegetables. So um, I thought that was a fun little take on it. Um, Portland on the left um, is a uh, take on sort of an old Mario Brothers game. Um, and really what we're showing here is with each of these sort of, you know, whether it's a dot or a castle or a vegetable, is sort of the density of coin operated machines within a given area. Um, and so you can kind of see that um, in, in Seattle, you know, Capitol Hill, um, you know, has a pumpkin there and then some dots and everything. It's just sort of showing, you know, okay, there's a little bit more uh, density of coin operated machines there than, um, you know, if you look down over by Alki um, or, or Georgetown even. So it is just a fun way to sort of visualize the data. Um, but like I said, it takes a little bit of cartographic freedom. Obviously, it's not spatially accurate because uh, it's just not really possible to do that with this kind of style. Um, and if we go to the next slide, um, we can kind of see here, this is San Francisco. Um, this is another uh, classic video game um, called Final Fantasy. Um, and so I just sort of took the, the, the various assets from that game, right? Take them from the game, but I, I recreated some of them from the game um, and just applied, you know, whether it's a, a, a castle or, or a big castle or a little village, uh, depending on how many uh, games there were. And again, if you're all familiar with San Francisco, um, that area of uh, downtown, you know, around Market Street, 
Um, you know, obviously there's a lot more uh, activity um, with regards to coin operated video games. Um, these were just really fun maps to make. Um, again, just a lot of, uh, just a very different way to think about maps in general. Um, and we had a lot of fun pulling these ones together. Um, yeah, you can go to the next one. Yeah, and so this is um, another one that I pulled together. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a big traveler myself. I uh, yeah, pre-COVID, um, you know, I, I really love to try and see as many places as possible in the world. Uh, I'm based here in Portland, um, and one of the things I always really uh, was fascinated by, especially being a transportation person in general, was just the level of access that you have depending on the city that you live in. Um, so those of you, uh, you know, who are in Seattle, um, you know, you guys have a lot more access, direct access to uh, uh, various places around the world than I do in Portland. In fact, for most of my trips abroad, um, I'm typically bouncing up to SeaTac and then flying out. Um, and that's just an interesting, you know, sort of concept to just understand just because it, it one, it sort of places the cities in, in a little bit of a hierarchy. Um, you know, you can kind of tell which cities are more, for lack of a better word, globally important based on how much um, access uh, they have around the world. Uh, if you look down at San Francisco, obviously you can get to a lot of different places. Um, and a lot of that you know, has to do with population. Um, uh, another part of it has to do with the uh, uh, sort of industries that, that and, and co corporations that are in each city. So um, you know, there are definitely flights that are established purely for direct access for a company to get from, you know, their European headquarters to the U.S. headquarters to their, uh, you know, J Japan headquarters, you know, wherever. Um, and so it's kind of interesting, you know, as I was mapping this out and just sort of seeing, you know, where can Seattle, San Francisco and Portland all fly to directly? Um, and it really does match up where San Francisco, um, obviously between them and Oakland have the, the largest amounts of flights. Um, and then Seattle, is sort of in the middle between Portland and uh, San Francisco. Um, interestingly enough, um, Seattle has the only direct flight between the three cities to Dubai, which I spent a little bit of time trying to figure out why, and I couldn't actually figure out um, a reason for that. Um, I just thought it was really interesting um, location that uh, if you really wanted to, you could fly direct to the Middle East. <laughs> So one of the topics that we thought a lot about exploring was tech because each of these cities has a really big tech scene. And as we thought about tech and struggled with ways to think, to talk about it, we also thought about ways in which there were old technologies that people were sometimes re-embracing like typewriters and things like that. So what we decided to do was take two moments in time and compare technology at two moments in time. So we, we chose some older technology. We chose typewriters, film developing, piano stores and record stores. And we went to the libraries for each of these three cities and we asked for their yellow pages from 1987, which they sent us copies of, like digital copies of. And we went through and we were able to count how many film developing stores, where they were and map them, um, piano stores, record stores, typewriter stores for each of these cities. But we thought that, you know, in order to map these older analog style technologies, it would be fun to do them in a different way. And David and I had given a talk at the Pacific Northwest College of the Arts and somebody came talk to us after and she said, this is really interesting what you're doing. I'd, I'd like to participate in something like this. And we were working on this. So we invited her to, uh, to some of our work sessions. Her name is Stephanie Sun. She's a fantastic artist and she created these three for us. And the one that you see of uh, San Francisco is on a piece of board and she's drawn on there. She's created her own stickers in order to map these different places. She did some needlepoint for Portland and each of those little dots is data-driven information about where these stores are. And then for Seattle, it might be hard to appreciate, but she did ink, um, you know, ink blo uh, block presses on different pieces of paper, cut them out, sewed them together in the shape of Seattle and then sewed on buttons to correspond with these different places. So these are real life maps that existed that we had to take pictures of um, for, uh, for the book, but they, they bring some flavor of the analog along with, with this theme that we thought was really compelling. And then the second page of the spread deals with where those places are today. And 
So we decided that we'd use a completely different sort of mode for mapping and we've got this zeros and ones, this sort of digital matrix like thing in the background in green. And then wherever there's a photo developing store, piano store, record store, typewriter store, that color pops out. So one of the things that we learned was that there's still a bunch of piano stores around, right? That's pretty interesting. But um, the aficionados of typewriters have it a little harder. Um, in 1987 in Portland, there were 28 typewriter stores. That's how business was done. Right? IBM Selectrix, whatever it is, that's how business is getting done. Today, there's only one typewriter store in Portland and that's the only one in all three cities. There's also an old camera, there's a camera store that sells typewriters in Portland, but Ace Typewriter on Lombard is the only one left. It was started in 1961 and the son of the individuals who started it is still running that. So we start looking at this kind of detail and we start getting actually some really small, interesting stories that you know, we couldn't really talk too much about, um, but finding out some of that local texture and what's still around, what's been a lot around for a long time is something that we've been able to explore and sort of celebrate with these pages comparing analog and digital technology. Okay, so here's some complicated looking maps, but um, what these are showing are um, street trees in each of the three cities. And by street trees, we generally mean those trees that are planted between the sidewalk and the curb in um, residential and commercial areas. And so to try to, to explain this somewhat simply, um, these hexagons here show two things the number of street trees in an area, and then the number of species in those particular areas. So the, the dark, big hexagons have a lot of street trees and, and a lot of different species. And then the light, small polygons have not so many street trees and not very many different species. And so um, what we like about mapping details like this is the patterns that come out of looking at these particular maps. Um, and so, and, and then try, why, why will you see more street trees or more diverse sets of species in given areas? And um, a few explanatory um, factors up that come to mind immediately in looking at these cities is, um, the neighborhood age, for example, um, whether sidewalks even exist or not in a given area, uh, no sidewalks means no street trees. And um, third, or I mean, interestingly is, is the general neglect you will see by the city of certain particular neighborhoods. These are planting of these trees is important in some places and not in others. Um, what we found interesting about San Francisco is it kind of had a different pattern from, from Portland and Seattle, which kind of had, had similar factors at play. In San Francisco, what you will um, often see is along major arterials, there'll be the same species planted over very long, mile-long stretches. Um, so not a lot of diversity of species. And also in the downtown of San Francisco, you won't see trees like you do in both Seattle and Portland in the downtown areas. Um, we also included, um, I think these kind of fun little graphics about street trees. And these sh show the top 20 um, species in each city. And so the number of leaves on each tree is proportional to um, how much of that species you find in each city. And I know you can't really see this in great detail, but it's kind of, fun to explore which trees you find in each city. So um, Stephanie Sun, who did those maps that Hunter just showed, um, made these graphics as well. So what we have here is a map that's not in the book, I should say. And rather, this is a map that lives in the geography department uh, at Portland State University. And we have a bunch of old wall maps from you know, the 1950s and 60s that we've collected. And this one is a Russian map that depicts um, general areas of wildlife. And it's not meant to be super specific, but give you sort of an uh, overview of where, uh, you know, different uh, ecoregions are and what animals predominate there. I think there's a close up 
on the next image to give you a little flavor of what we're dealing with here. And you can see that, you know, it's not that you should use this to know exactly where the polar bears are, but it's an idea, it's sort of the artist bringing art and cartography together in a way that we thought was really compelling. And so Zuriel Van Bell, who's one of the main contributors for the book, um, decided, and she's got a passion for, for these topics, uh, for animals. And so what she did in working with her sister, who's an illustrator, was create a version of that Russian animal map uh, for the upper left. And so they chose the animals that they thought we predominated, um, including, you know, a lion, because there's a safari park that has a lion. And if you, you know, if you know the area, then you know what that means. And then working together to, to create this map with the sort of stippled in the background to imitate the sort of background texture of that Russian map, putting these animals here, and then having the opportunity to write some fun descriptions for each of the animals um, on, the, uh, on the guide on the left. And uh, this is one of the ways that we sort of spanned out beyond just sort of what people were doing, but looking at uh, animal life, uh, wildlife, and also getting beyond the cities themselves and looking at the region a little bit more generally uh, with a map like this. Okay, so here's um, a few maps that we call traffic light tapestries. And, you know, they might, initial impression is they look something I would say like stained glass but um, you'll find a portion of one of these on the cover of the book but what they actually are is a systematic division of the city based on the location of traffic lights and those traffic lights are shown in the little inset map on the left that has white dots for traffic lights on a gray background and so to kind of read this, this map, uh, um, besides being interesting to look at, you can learn something about the nature of um, the city. And so, like if you look at downtown um, Seattle where the, the shapes, the areas are very small because there are many traffic lights where in um, sort of some outlying areas without many lights, you get these very large areas. And then once you learn how to read the map, you can start to see different features of the city, which I think are kind of kind of fun to do. What's very notable to me on this one is you can see um, Rainier Avenue, you know, in the southeast part of the city. If you can almost recognize it, even though it's not showing lines, it's showing areas. Um, so a couple other, the other two cities, um, you can see Again, areas of the city that are, I, I would say, are more suburban than the um, kind of uniform grid of the central city. Um, you know, in San Francisco, you can see that as well, but you can also see then a series of grids of different shapes and sizes. So in a different grid in the Mission District than downtown, a different grid in the Sunset than um, in these other two areas and so on. And so, I think they're, besides being very interesting maps to look like, they're pretty um, fun, um, the fun maps to explore as well. And so I'd like to give a shout out to Sachi Arakawa for her work on these. I unmute myself. All right. Um, yeah. So, uh... 2020 was an interesting year for a lot of reasons. I'm sure everybody uh, knows. Um, you know, one of those um, was certainly um, you know the the day that George Floyd was was uh, killed in Minneapolis was murdered in Minneapolis, um, and it sort of um, you know caused a, a moment for the entire country. Um, and and we were certainly not. Um, uh, any different um, from a lot of places around the country in that respect. So, you know, after George Floyd was murdered, um, you know, there was a lot of protests in all three of our cities. And, you know, we sort of wanted to document what was really happening during those first hundred days. It was really important um, to, you know, reflect on, you know, where things were happening in each city and how they were sort of evolving in each city, because each city has similar trends, but but also differences. You know, if we look at um, 
you know, San Francisco had a lot of uh, activity uh, in sort of the first, you know, couple of months, um, but it didn't really uh, last as long as maybe what was happening in Portland and Seattle. Um, and certainly some of the things that were happening in Seattle um, were very unique uh, for really any place in the country. Um, you know, if you're talking about the, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone um, um, or, um, you know, I'm spacing on the, the name that eventually e evolved into um, was very different. And, and certainly in Portland, it, it became um, a very different story as well as, you know, the city um, had federal agents deployed to it and, you know, it was causing a bunch of um, headlines around the, the country for that. Um, and so it was really important for us just to talk about this um, because it was not only a momentous occasion for the, the country, but also just for, for our cities. And, and so we sort of mapped out here on this timeline, the first hundred days. Um, and we sort of ended it on September 7th, which is kind of when um, there were some historic smoke, wildfire smokes that sort of temporarily halted protests in Portland and Seattle, although they did pick up um, afterwards. Um, but yeah, uh, you can go to the next slide. And then to, to switch over to a little bit of a lighter subject, um, you know, one thing that uh, Hunter and I uh, really liked, uh, like to talk about uh, just amongst ourselves is sports, um, you know, and, and really stadiums is, is sort of an interesting topic that we both sort of gravitated towards um, because both or all three cities have had sort of a rich history of sports throughout the, you know, the last hundred years or so. Um, and in particular, you know, we start talking about um, uh, baseball, right? Um, you know, all, all three cities have had a number of baseball stadiums that have sort of come and gone uh, uh, over the years and often in places that, um, you know, you would never suspect that there would have been a baseball stadium today. Um, you know, in, in particular, you know, in my hometown of Portland, um, there was a, a street or a stadium called Bond Street Park um, that uh, was, I think at the time it was about 14,000 seats. Um, it was kind of where the, the premier Portland uh, baseball team was playing. And, and today it's sort of just an industrial park and you would never know, um, aside from, you know, digging up some history on it. Uh, this picture here on the right, that is, um, that's, that's from Seattle. That's, that's Kingdom being uh, uh imploded, uh, which I think might still be the largest implosion, um, certainly for the country. Um, so it's just sort of an interesting history uh, around uh, sports in, in each of these stadiums. Hunter, I don't know if you want to add anything on to that as well. Um, one of the things that we're not able to share, but but we all did a bunch of research on the various team names over the years and, and the different sports associated with that. So there's a really interesting graph that Jeff put together. It looks really nice of of that court that shows you the different names of teams, what sports they were uh, over time. So that's another thing that, that we were able to pull together for this, in addition to a timeline for major events that happened, uh, mm -hmm. which you can see a little of right here. Yeah, and this, this is a sort of a timeline that's spread across uh, four different pages. Um, so we've just sort of, we wanted to visualize it, sort of how it, how it sort of winds its way through. Um, but it's just a fun way to uh, see you know, sort of where highlights are happening with regards to sports and stadiums within each of our three cities. Um, and certainly, you know, in the early parts of, uh, uh, I think like in the late 1800s, San Francisco had a lot more activity um, than, than either Portland or Seattle. Um, uh, but then, then it sort of concludes, you know, all three cities just have a lot going on. Certainly the last 20 or 30 years is, you know, new stadiums are getting built, NFL stadiums, new baseball stadiums, um, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay, so we're going to close up here real quick with a couple final extracts from the book. We have this series of pages called Breaking the Grid, um, which explores urban forms in the city. And so for Seattle, what's shown here is um, taking the blocks of two different areas, the downtown area and then um, a diagonal street, in this case, Madison, um, and then taking the blocks which are formed by streets and then rearranging them into different shapes. Um, this work was inspired by a, a French artist, Armel Caron. And um, we just like what she was doing and wanted to kind of um, give it a try for all three cities. And it makes for um, interesting 
little little design but also like in seattle you for downtown you can see these long skinny blocks a lot of them are formed because there's so many alleys in downtown that form you know the shapes that we see and we paired that with um, these shapes these unusual or curious urban forms or neighborhoods that don't seem to fit in each of these places so in um, Seattle, Portland, you could think of the Laurelhurst neighborhood. There's one in each of the cities. Um, and shown here on the, the right are three of these places in Southwest San Francisco and um, almost suburban-like developments within the city itself. Just so these make for, um, you know, interesting graphics to sort of explore. Um, and a thank you to Alicia Milligan and Lauren McKinney-Wise for their work on this. And lastly. So we thought it would be really interesting to make a map that was based on words. And after throwing around some ideas, we realized that a crossword puzzle might lend itself really well to that. And so the way these were made was I got out some graph paper and made a list of locations for each city. And this started put writing them on there and trying to see if I could get it to work. Uh, there was a lot of erasing and bad spelling that went on during this, but eventually we were able to come up with this discrete maps, which Zuriel then took and put into a digital form. And one of the, there was a lot of fun that we had in researching this book, but one of the moments that was really kind of comes to mind as the most fun was researching the clues for each of these. So for each, each um, answer that we had, we researched, I think, three or four potential clues that we could have included. And then when we had meetings with our contributors, we'd, we'd read them out. And the ones that people thought were the best are usually the ones that we included. So there's a lot of collaboration that went into there as well. And these are some of the, the last maps uh, in the book. But we've also got these blank versions of these uh, on our website. So uh, rosecitygeo.com, uh, maybe we could put that in the chat or something. Um, but there's a, there's a website we've created with a little bit more information about how we created the book. And then we've also got blank versions of this so that you can try them out and then uh, look at the answers in the book itself. And our final thoughts. Um, we entertained hundreds of topics. Um, coming up with ideas of what we maybe could map was pretty easy, but coming up with ideas that could be then research and then distilled into an interesting story and be represented visually by for all three cities was the hard part. Um, and some obvious topics um, that might be typical of all three cities just didn't fit this particular model. They didn't necessarily make a good story. Um, but the real take home here is that we collaborated with this extraordinary extended community of students and alums and friends that gave us a wide range of perspectives than we might have had just on our own. And lastly, here's all of our contributors to this book in, in some way, shape, or form. So thank you. A huge crew, but Zuriel, Sachi, and Jeff, we want to give the extra shout out for the enormous amount of work uh, that they performed. But really, the, the flavor of this book is, is the passion and interest and efforts of all these different people. So uh, we thank them all. We thank these classes. We thank Sasquatch. Um, and uh, thank you for having us here today as well. All right, so at this point, we generally shift towards questions. So audience members, if you have any questions, now is definitely the time. Speak up. We'd love, love, love to hear from you. Um, in the meantime, um, I have a question, which is, um, was there anything that you left out of the book that you wish especially that had made into it? Um, and and why did you why did you make some of those decisions? <laughs> One of the things that happened was that we finished the book in March of 2020. Y'all remember March of 2020, right? Early March 2020. And then there was late March 2020, and COVID completely changed everything. And this book was going to come out last year. It was held back. And so in the fall, we realized we had some time before printing. We would we would write some new information about the protests, the stuff that Jeff showed you about the new election. 
Um, there were a few other things, but we had to take out sections of the book in order to replace those. One of them was on pedestrian accidents. And we'd spent quite a lot of time looking at the patterns of pedestrian accidents over time in the three cities. Uh, we're all walkers, we're all really concerned with street safety. So that's something we'd have loved to have in the book, but we're, we weren't able to include because we had to prioritize some of these some of these things that came up from 2020. Something that was especially an interest of mine was independent movie theaters that we explored um, quite a bit. And sadly, um, it became more of a story of, of lost um, independent movie theaters than it became ones that actually existed any anymore. And so it then turned into a big history project and eventually it just, as much as I love the topic, we decided we would um, drop that. We also looked at novels from each city, about each city, and we wanted to, it's something we tried with Portland, this couldn't get to work, and we really wanted to try to create maps that spoke to these different works of fiction. And, but we, we couldn't, we just, we read and we talked about it and we weren't able to come up with a coherent set of maps and, 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 and text that would have told that story. So that's something that we're still wondering about how to do. Um, and maybe we'll come back to, but that's another thing that didn't quite make Yeah, I think book descriptions are so individualized that it made it very hard to picture how you would visualize it. Visualizing, say, a film is, is one thing, but visualizing what you imagine in your head for a book is a lot harder. Still love the idea, though. Well, and then we had this one idea that we were going to... Um, repurpose a board game for each city and make the city look like the board game. So we had Monopoly for San Francisco. We had, I think, Candyland for Portland and Shoots and Ladders maybe for Seattle. Um, and that was a great idea that we, we just, that was only a great idea and we couldn't get past the ideas. <laughs> it's really hard once you, uh, I mean, you can make maps out of, you know, you can, you can create so many different maps with, out of so many different data, but finding the right combination is sort of you know it, it's it's sort of the the the, the key to a lot of these uh, pages um, and so many great ideas you just can't get over that that sort of hill um, so there's a lot of maps that you know we we all sort of started exploring a little bit you get you know a little bit into it and then all of a sudden um, you would just hit a wall and you can't you can't really proceed with it as much as you might want to or as much as you might try and force it through um, at some points you just have to let it go. <laughs> and since the topic topic had to work for all three cities, there were a number of things that would work for maybe two cities. Or it was really interesting in one city and not so much in the other. So lots of reasons things didn't make it. Questions for us. So I, I think that people are being shy. That's okay. But if you have anything you're wondering, now is the time, folks. We're getting to the end of our evening. Um, we're just going to give you a couple more minutes. In the meantime, um, was there anything that was that really surprised you while you were doing research for these for these maps and for this book? Well, one of the maps that David showed at the end, we didn't really talk about, looked like there's a bunch of plants on a map of Portland. And so one of the things that we did since marijuana has been legalized in all three cities. We were mapped where all the shops were. And we were a little surprised to find out that Portland had as much as the other two cities put together. Um, so that was a little surprising to us. Um, the other thing that we that maybe wasn't surprising, but that we confirmed was just how much more expensive it is to live in San Francisco than these other cities. So we looked at the uh, medium uh, house price in each city. And in Portland, it's a little bit, it's a roughly double the national average, so expensive. Seattle, roughly double Portland. San Francisco, roughly double Seattle. So there's a hierarchy there. And, you know, if you're able to buy a place and, and rents would follow a similar pattern. So I don't know if that was surprising or just more confirming that, yeah, this, this is the way it plays out in these cities. I think a few of our more like wonky pages pro probably provided some surprises. Like we looked at both the, the shipping ports and the airport data and what are the products coming in and out of those. And um, not necessarily what we thought that would be. Um, 
we won't dive into those details, but it, it you you constantly learn about these different places that you thought you knew really well. Yeah, a lot of the value going through the port of San Francisco is through the airport. There's very little value comparatively going through the actual water port. A lot of that's happening over in Oakland, but through SFO, there are a lot of computer chips coming through there worth a lot of money. And the variety of goods that come into Seattle is mind boggling. Just the different kinds of things, which for San Francisco and, um, and Portland is not the case. Oh, okay, we've got a question. It says, tell us something that was fascinating about one city that didn't work well for the other two. We promised that we have to come up with it. Right. Um, well, one well, thing I was really interested in how um, <laughs> steep the streets were in different places. And we tried our best to make that happen. But for technical reasons, we couldn't display that. You know, it's like we expected this nice hierarchy, of course, San Francisco and then Seattle's got its set of steep streets and Portland does as well. Um, just didn't. Each the Portland thing a, fell apart, kind of. Each city has a hill street, and we were going to look at hill street to see which was the most steep. It turned out to be San Francisco, by the way, which is maybe not surprising. <laughs> Another thing that we researched were sounds, and so we did successfully um, create maps about church bell sounds throughout the city, um, but we wanted to add the sound of train whistles uh, as well, but we realized that it, it sets up much better for Seattle and Portland than it does for San Francisco, so that element of the sound map was left off because... It didn't work so hot for San Francisco. Thank you for the question, Paula. Stairways. Ooh, we actually, we do have something in stairways in there because there's maps that talk about alleyways in each city. They're very different patterns from place to place. And we indicated where there were stairs. I'm not sure, we probably weren't exhaustive because there's a lot in each of these cities. San Francisco has a lot. But anyways, we've got some information on stairs and alleyways in the book, so you can check. Yeah, and it depends on the, the thing with stairways is, you know, what constitutes a stairway? How many stairs do you have to have? But we tried our best to be, include as many of those as we could. And I think it's an interesting thing um, in, in all three cities, actually. As, as our, um, we have the page on, it's tied to the page on alleys, uh, which have different functions in the different cities, even though uh, you'll find them everywhere. They really have different purposes. Um, you won't find downtown alleys in Portland, but you will in um, Seattle, everywhere. Did you find any association between alleys and human behavior, crime and homelessness? We didn't go that deep into it, really. We looked more at how they worked within the urban form rather than how they were being used. Although that would be certainly an interesting thing uh, to continue on. And, and a number of us are pretty interested in alleys is this very sort of liminal space sometimes in cities between things. So there's certainly some work that could be done. And we do have pages, a page pair on um, homeless encampments, um, but collecting that data is very difficult. Each of the three cities provided data in different sorts of ways. Um, so made for a uh, comparison across three cities, very difficult. There's a question about bookstore locations. We, we didn't, it was tricky. When mapping something that was static was hard for us to make sure we could tell a good story about. So we know we're, you know, there are maps of, of bookstores and, and we love those maps because we love <clears throat> bookstores, but how to give a new story, how to give a new life to that wasn't something we were able to figure out. So, you know, like music venues is something that we thought to, vent, to, to map, but we didn't do that either because we weren't sure we could bring something new to that story that would fit with the sort of the, the vibe of the book. Good questions, everybody, thank you. All right, so we are about at the end of our evening. So I'm back, hello everyone. Um, it's about time to call it a night, but I just wanted to take this last minute to thank you all so very much for being here. This was such a great conversation and presentation. Um, it really, change some of the ways that I think about the way we 
understand and navigate cities. It was so interesting. The art was incredible. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, audience members, thank you so for turning out. We're so happy to have you here always. Um, for everyone who'd like to get your hands on a copy of Upper Left Cities, go ahead and follow that link in the chat. I'll give you just a second to go ahead and do that. Um, of If you're local, of course, you can come on in and grab a copy. If you're not local, we, of course, ship. Um, let us know, of course, what you thought of this event in person or on social media. Either way, we love to hear from you. And then Hunter, David, and Jeff, a huge, huge thank you for being here and sharing your work with us. Uh, this was such a pleasure. And with that, I think it's time to bid you all a good night. So shall we do the awkward waving thing? <laughs> Let's do it. Thank you. All Thanks, right. everyone. everyone. Good night, everyone. Have a good Saturday night. Yeah, you too.